we had just a few hours to get moved out and we had a semi trailer backed up to our house and my phone would not stop ringing with people calling upset about what had happened to us and why it should have and how can they do this and this isn't right and all this kind of stuff knowing that we needed to load everything in this truck immediately and I finally said you know I, I don't need your opinion about anything right now what I need right now is to help load this truck amen and uh, so please don't take people for granted in your life what they do for you the ones that really help you and they're always there and, and that kind of stuff let's uh I want to pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, again, I ask you um, for your will to be done in this place, as always. I ask you to reveal yourself through your word. Holy Spirit, I ask you to reveal a glorified Jesus to us today and every time we're in this house. Because we know the more that we behold him or the more we see him, the more he is revealed to us the more we become like Him. I pray, God, people don't see me or hear me, but they see you and they hear you. And we give you the praise for it all in the name of Jesus. If you agree with me, say amen. We'll let the kids be dismissed to Children's Church and get started on this this morning. I, I, want to, uh, I, just want to, I just want to take my time today. I hope that's okay with you. I'm not going to tell you how long I'm going to preach because I've lied to you the last 15 times I've said that. And so... We're just going to go for a while and see where the Holy Spirit takes us or how far in this. I've been studying this topic for some time now, and we're just going to, if I have a title of the message today, it's going to be Introduction to Fire. <laughs> Introduction to Fire. How many ever feel like you've been through the fire? Been through the flames? They say uh, the worship, song sings, uh, worship team sings a song, and one of the phrases in that song says, As I stand in the flames... And I want to deal with our perception of fire. I think this is something that the Lord is dealing with me about. And um, I mentioned this last week that how many know fire has more, uh, it has good and bad in it. Fire is heat, is energy, it's power, it's strength, it's warmth. But it's also destruction and can be very destructive. And so when we look at fire in Scripture, I want us to be careful of how we see it and see it um, in the right perspective. And so I want to talk about perspective just a minute and kind of get you uh, to, to see where I'm headed or maybe to, 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 to hone in with me this morning. Perspective, and you hear me say this a lot here about the difference between uh, and, and preaching things in context. You can't just pull a Scripture out of the book anywhere and just say this is what God's saying. You say, well, how can you say that? That's the Word of God. It is the inspired Word of God. Amen? God inspired it. I do believe it is His words. I do believe that it is what the hand of man wrote through the inspiration of God. Uh, I believe it is perfect. It is inerrant. It is absolutely true. It is the foundation of all truth. And so I would never take a thing away from the Word of God, but the problem with the Word of God is when we take it out of context of who they're talking to, where they're at, what time this is in history, the setting they're in, who they're talking to, the audience relevance is key so many times. And so you can't just grab a scripture out somewhere and say, see, this is what God said. He did say that. Absolutely he said that. But he might not have been talking to you. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you he wasn't talking to you. He was talking to them many of the times. And so one of the other things, as we, as, and you guys hear this a lot here, and I know I'm, I'm uh, going over this maybe a little slower, a little detailed for some of you here, but um, you hear me talk a lot about pre-cross and post-cross. In other words, before the cross and after the cross. Before Jesus came and after Jesus came. How many know there's a difference? Jesus, even in the New Testament, what we call the New Testament, uh, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're written of the accounts of the life of Jesus in the earth, but how many know he was still living under an old covenant? The new covenant had not been cut until Jesus died, until Jesus was resurrected. So Jesus was living under a set of rules or laws or covenants which God had made with the children of Israel and mankind, but yet he was operating 
in a new covenant way. And he was giving us the illustration of how to operate when this new thing comes, but he could even do it and was even doing it under the old covenant, but yet he still honored it many times. One of my, one of my favorite examples of when the, the lepers came to him to be healed, and he told them, he, 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 uh, he prayed for them, they were healed, and it said they take off and they leave. One of them comes back and thanks Jesus and falls at his feet and worships him. And the Bible says that the others were healed, but that one was made whole. That's huge to me. But what he told the lepers to do was to go show yourself to the priest. How many know under the old covenant, that's what they had to do if a leper... Uh, was cleansed or had went through a cleansing process, they had to go show themselves to the priest and the priest would declare them clean. And if we, if we really thought about that for a minute, we would think, well, wait a minute, Jesus already healed them. Why did they need to do that? Because Jesus kept the law perfectly. And he, and he, and he knew that the law hadn't been abolished yet and it, that hadn't been uh, done away with yet. And so he still ordered them to go ahead and show yourself to the priest even though they were healed. You with me? Many things that Jesus did and said um, pre-cross, people will take and preach out of context and throw it into our life today and tell us that's what we need to be like because that's this. He said this or did this, but this is before the cross. This is before it all changed. This is before a new covenant was cut. It's good to see Bailey's back. I hope you enjoyed your vacation while you made us all jealous. Um, <laughs> sorry, deflection. Um, but it's so important. And I want to just give you a couple illustrations here. Uh, and, and you guys uh, that, are, that are here all the time know that I use these kinds of things a lot. If you think about just the life of Jesus when Jesus was born, the first woman that touched Jesus in the earth was Mary, his mother. Right? The Bible says she found favor with God. She was, she was the mother of Jesus. She's the first one to touch Jesus. But how many know who the one that came to touch him the first time after the resurrection was a harlot. That speaks volumes to me because under the old covenant, it was about perfection and purity and all this kind of stuff. Mary was pure. Mary was a virgin. You look at Mary's life, all this, and she was the one to touch Jesus. But now after the resurrection, we're given a picture of grace and here is the first woman to see Jesus and she attempts to touch Him and she's a harlot. You see the difference? It's not about being perfect anymore to touch Jesus. You, it was the first time, but now grace is involved. And now anybody has access to Jesus. You're saying, now wait a minute, but he told her, wait. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. If you would go with me to, first, uh, to the book of John, verse, uh, chapter 7. Book of John, chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. <clears throat> this is Jesus with his disciples. He says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, this is before the cross, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I want to stop right there just for a minute. What a concept. With Jesus, if, if you take a drink of me, it'll become a river. What an exchange. If you just get a drink of me, it will become a river that flows out of you. And I wanted to go into to water and rivers and all this kind of stuff. But let me just say this. If you stutter, study water in Scripture and rivers and anything to do with water, it is um, always significant of the outpouring, the presence, the power of God pouring out. And so people that see visions of water and rivers and, and things like that know that, that that is symbolic of the Spirit of God just flowing in life. And we know the story of the Scripture um, that, that says out of the, the temple, the water went down the steps and out into the streets. And wherever that river flows, life comes. Amen? He is the giver of life. But he says, who believes in me? As the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Go ahead. i got to get going. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him, now get the context, we're standing here today, Jesus, back then, Jesus is talking to people, this is pre-cross, and he says, but this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out yet, 
whom those believing in Him would in the future receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Here's the key. Because. Everybody say because. Jesus was not yet glorified. Pre-cross. The Holy Spirit could not be poured out Because Jesus was not yet glorified. I'm just telling you what the Scripture said. I'm giving you the because of what the Scripture said. It's not my opinion, it's what the Scripture says. Amen? So you with me so far? The Holy Spirit could not be poured out before Jesus was glorified because He has not been glorified. So you say, why? What does that mean? I want to explain that. He's not yet glorified. The reason was He has not yet been glorified. That's why the Spirit could not be poured out. What is the Holy Spirit's work in us? What does the Holy Spirit do? What is the Holy Spirit's job in us today as New Covenant believers? You can talk back to me. I don't care. There's not a wrong answer. There's a lot of answers to this in Scripture. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit's a comforter. The Holy Spirit's a teacher that guides us unto all truth. The Holy Spirit... uh, empowers us, the power of the Holy Spirit, teaches us, strengthens us, leads us. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you unto all truth. The Holy Spirit does a lot of things. Amen? That's, that's where I was headed. You're staying ahead of me. <laughs> Say that again. He magnifies and glorifies Jesus to us and in us. So if you sum it all up together, that's what I was getting ready to say, if you take all these things together that the Scripture says that He does, it's boiled basically down into one statement, and she said it. To magnify and reveal Jesus in us. So the Holy Spirit could not be poured out yet because Jesus wasn't glorified. So the Holy Spirit couldn't magnify and glorify a pre-cross Jesus. Stay with me. It's simple, but it's profound. Because if the Holy Spirit was poured out before Jesus was glorified, we would all have a pre-cross Jesus heading to a cross, not a Jesus who had been to the cross and was risen and had defeated everything and was seated at the right hand of the Father. How many know your concept of Jesus doesn't need to be the Jesus going to the cross and the suffering and the shame and under the law and all that. Our concept of Jesus and what God wants to reveal in us is a victorious, overcoming, overcame Jesus who is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He has position. His work is finished. And that is the Jesus that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. God Himself said He couldn't pour out the Holy Spirit yet because Jesus wasn't glorified yet. Jesus hasn't accomplished what he did he hasn't went to the father and been glorified and so the holy spirit is not going to reveal an unglorified jesus he's going to reveal to us a glorified jesus that's do you get the concept what i'm trying to say that's why these things are so important that's why you hear me talk about you can't you can't just pull stuff out a lot of people and i've done it myself have preached a pre-cross Jesus to people and put us under this pressure of being like Jesus, being like Jesus. I'm all about being like Jesus, but I want to be like the glorified Jesus, not the dying Jesus. Amen? The Bible said that He defeated sin. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. I don't have to defeat that anymore because that has been done. Now, I need to represent the glorified Jesus. Are we okay? That's why I'm so passionate about this, because I I see people struggle all the time with trying to be like Jesus, and I'm just suffering, and I'm just doing this stuff. Absolutely. We're, We're not so arrogant that we shouldn't uh, think that in this life we won't have tribulation. Jesus said that. But if the Holy Spirit's going to reveal a Jesus to me, my Bible says that He didn't pour Him out until after Jesus was glorified. And Jesus said when He come out of the tomb and Mary stands there and she said, I thought He was the gardener. And Jesus said, don't touch me yet because I have not ascended to my Father and your Father. Amen? I skipped the whole page. No. 
I'll make some other references that are similar to this about fire. And I'm just going to show you scripture. Okay? So we're going to be introducing the introduction to fire and the baptism of fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. This is John the Baptist. He's standing in the River Jordan. He's baptizing people. This Jesus, this Messiah that has been prophesied for all these years that is coming to redeem humanity, that is coming to redeem people. John the Baptist is saying to those people, repent, change the way you think, because the kingdom is at hand. All this stuff that we've been hearing that was coming, you need to change the way you think because it's right here in our grasp. Now get the picture in time, in context of where he's at. It, this is Jesus coming. We've heard of this Jesus coming that's going to be revealed. And John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness. He comes out of nowhere. He's beard hanging down. He looks like somebody off a of duck dynasty or worse. He's standing there in a leather girdle and he's screaming at people, repent. He's not saying, Re oh, Lord help me. Change the way you think the kingdom is at hand. It's not coming anymore, people. It's here. And he looks up and he sees Jesus. And he says, behold the Lamb the culmination of everything that was coming, who takes away the sins of the world. And he makes this statement. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Everybody say, change your mind. Change the way you think. I do believe repentance does include feeling sorry for the things that you've done. But the word, Greek word is metanoia. It's always metanoia. It means change the way you think. Change. How many know even the, just in the concept of feeling sorry or for things that you do, like when Trevor yells at Ricky and he's mean and he feels sorry for it, he repents, but the repenting means more than just feeling bad. The repenting means he changes. Amen? He said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me, everybody say he. Who's he talking about? Jesus. He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, everybody say he. Jesus. Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So I have two questions. Three questions. Who's the he? So who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit? If you were in our Holy Spirit class, you would know that we've spent a lot of time making that clear that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, baptizes us into Jesus. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. And the Scripture is very plain with that. Very, very emphatic that that is exactly who does the baptizing. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit and fire. Everybody say, and fire. Jesus is the one who baptizes or immerses us by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who does that. And Jesus is the one who does the same thing in fire. So when you're in the fire and I'm in the fire, I'll just do a little commercial up front in the beginning. It's not the devil. Amen? But if God's good, wouldn't that fire be good too? Is the Holy Spirit good? So is the fire. Tell your neighbor the fire is good. Let it burn, baby. Let it burn. Exodus chapter 3. Uh, did I have Revelation one fourteen on there first? Let's do that. Revelation one fourteen. We're just going to jump all the way at the end of the book. John is on the Isle of Patmos. The Bible says that he has this revelation of Jesus. The title of the book is a revelation of Jesus, not the revelation of the Antichrist. That's key. The whole book's not about the Antichrist. The whole book is about a revealing, unveiling, that word reveal, unveiling of Jesus. 
And he gives us all kinds of pictures from Genesis 1 on. But he said he begins to describe him. They throw him out on the beach. He's been boiled in, in oil to where he's just this nasty looking piece of burnt flesh. And the king couldn't stand to look at him anymore. They couldn't kill him. He was the disciple of love. He was the one who was the closest to Jesus. He's the one who laid his heart, his, his ear right to the very heartbeat of Jesus. He even claimed himself that he was the one who Jesus loved. That's a pretty bold statement. I'm the one he really loved. So I always call John the, the, the disciple of love. How I many know oh, you can't kill love? They tried it. They couldn't kill him. I mean, boiled the guy in oil. And he wouldn't die. And so finally the king said, just get him out and get him away from me. I can't stand to look at him. And so they take John and they dump him out on an island to leave him. The name of the island is Patmos, which means my dying or my killing. Guy sacrificed his whole life. He did nothing but love people. He pours out his love. He's the only disciple they couldn't kill. And they throw him on an island to die. And all of a sudden, the Bible says he hears a voice behind him. Everybody say behind. In the past. Finished. And he turns around and he sees this guy. And he begins to try to describe him. And one of the descriptions he describes of Jesus is his head and hair were white like wool. White as snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. Isn't it amazing that the eyes, we always say this, the eyes are the window to the soul or the heart. And if you want to know if somebody's telling the truth, very few people can look you dead in the eye and lie to you. I told you I have a highway patrol friend that told me they teach them in highway patrol school. Always watch their eyes because if they lie, they'll look left. They'll blink. They'll look. Look away. It takes a pretty messed up person to just look you dead in the eye and lie. I don't want to go any further with that, but... I thought about the people who couldn't stand to look at Jesus because the fire is purifying. When you look somebody dead in the eye, they're like, oh God, hope you don't see my soul. <laughs> don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. You get a guy with a prophetic gift and he starts walking around towards the crowd and he can just walk over this way and five people go, <laughs> don't let him see me. But there again, you want to know why they do that so many times? Is because they're scared because they have an Old Testament prophet mentality of fire and judgment in a bad way versus a New Testament prophet. The Bible says the only thing a New Testament prophet or a New Covenant prophet should do is exhort and encourage. So if somebody begins to prophesy this gloom and doom and all this judgment and this fire of God, you need to understand if they're going to call out fire, they better, you better listen close because... Jesus dealt with this himself too. We'll get there in a minute. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 6. I'm just going to hit a few of these until we get to 2 o'clock and we'll leave and go home. But Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 says, this is Moses. When he's getting ready to call the first deliverer of the children of Israel, the guy that's going to lead them out of bondage, he has spent his whole life with the Egyptians, he, his mother, you know the story, gave him up, put him in a basket and sends him down the Nile River with crocodiles and snakes and everything else because the king who is destroying all the male childs, all the male children because he was afraid of losing his position, the same situation when Jesus came. Uh, the king had heard that there was a new king going to be born so he began to kill baby boys. Just like this with Moses. Moses, and she puts him in a basket in faith and says, God, you gave this kid to me. I'm going to put him in here. I'm going to do everything I can to save him. And she ends up getting him back and actually getting paid to raise her son. Talk about redemption. Isn't God cool? Most atrocious thing going on that you could think of of killing babies. Sounds familiar, don't it? And right in the midst of that, God shows up with a deliverer. And so Moses is found, she raises him, they t he has all the best schools, best education, he lives the high life, but there's something down within him that can't stand the fact of seeing people abused and beaten and, and things. And finally one day that just comes up out of him and he kills a man. And so he has to run and he goes to the wilderness. Now he's in the wilderness for 40 years. The dude's 80. 
We think we wait a long time for ministry or opportunities. This guy, 80. And one day, he's just keeping sheep, minding his own business. And all of a sudden, he sees a bush on fire. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, a bush. It's on fire. And he watched it for a little while, and it didn't burn up. So he looked, and behold, and the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look up on him. There's that eyes in the fire thing again. Moses heard a voice from the fire. Everybody say, from the fire. How many of you have ever been through fiery trials in your life and right in the midst of the fire of the trial of your life, all of a sudden you hear God, you see God, and you realize God was in the fire with me. And the fire was never supposed to be about burning me up. The fire was about burning up all the other stuff. And God never left me. It's the, it's the, it's the picture of the Hebrew children in the fire, the three boys in the fire. Who was in the fire with them? So the fire can't be bad. The fire just reveals God. 2 Kings verse 1, 10 through 14. I'm going to go back to this fiery judgment. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of the fifty, If I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Anybody want Old Testament God? Old Testament judgment? I don't know if this guy's a preacher or not. And I stood up here and said, well, I guess if I am, I'll just burn you all up. <laughs> Anybody want that? And then he sent to him another captain of 50. I mean, this king's not real sharp. Let's send 50 more. I think you guys can get him. And then he sent him another captain of 50 and his 50 uh, captain another captain of 50 with his 50 men. So we got 51 more guys. Now we're to 102 guys. And he answered and said to him, Man of God, thus has the king said, Come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Now we got 102 dead guys. Smoked. And again, he sent a third captain of 50. How'd you like to be that guy? <laughs> Talk about no eye contact. Foo. We're busy. Guys, look busy. <laughs> he sent a captain of 50 with his men, and the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah, and he pleaded with him and said to him, Man of God, I have no doubt whether you're a man of God. Please let my life and the life of my 50 servants be yours, or be of yours, be precious in your sight. Twice he burns up 102 guys, or 50, 51 guys. Why is that? Why am I using that? Turn to the New Testament with me if you would. I'm going to give you the illustration of the old and new on the fire and judgment. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. We're in introduction on this today, so don't look for a completion. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. Jesus is about to send his disciples out. The Bible says he called 12 disciples together pre cross, gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. The Holy Spirit was on them, but He wasn't in them. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Even pre-cross, the message was the kingdom. And He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Can I stop right here? How many have ever heard anybody preach, if you're going to do things for God, Jesus said Himself, you don't need to take anything with you, brother, just go by faith and just go and do it. Because He said it right there. Everybody say pre-cross. Remember what he told them after the cross? Remember what he told them later? Anybody got a knife? Oh yeah, we got one. You need to take it with you. You're going to need it this time. 
And he said to them, take nothing. Okay, whatever house you enter, I'm sorry. Whatever house you enter, stay here and from there depart. Skip on down if you would. Clear down to uh, chapter or nine, chapter 9, verse 51 to 54. Jesus has sent His disciples out. They're all jacked up. They go out. they got power over demons. They're healing the sick. They're, raising, they're, they're casting devils out. They're doing all the stuff that Jesus gave them power to do. And they come back. They're all excited. And they're talking about, we have power over demons. And Jesus talks about, uh, don't be so excited about that. Be glad that your names are written. And then He goes on to say, and then they go to another town. And we're going to pick up there when they go into this next town. And it says, now it came to pass when time had come for Him to be... Received up that he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem and sent messengers before him or before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So he sent some guys ahead to set up a camp meeting. Can I put it in today's terms? I'm going to go preach in this town. I need you all to go to town and get a place set up for me because I'm going there to preach. And they're jacked up. It's like, great. I wonder what's going to happen in this town. Last time he's casting out devils and we've just seen all this stuff. That I mean, we got to find a place. And so they go to the place and it says, but the people did not receive him because his face was set for a journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume these guys just like Elijah did? And Jesus is going, guys, things are changing. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't give you more verses than that. Can you us to go to the next one? Most of you know what Jesus said. I'll paraphrase it. He said, do you guys not realize what spirit you're of? He turned and rebuked them and he said, do you not know what manner of spirit you are? Can we go again? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. There's an illustration where somebody's trying to take an Old Testament story in Scripture, even his very own disciples, and said, hey, these guys don't believe in you. Can we smoke them like Elijah did? That'll fix them. I have had close personal friends that that was their concept of God today. They would get mad and leave a church and say, God told me he wrote Ichabod over the door. Another Old Testament story. Why? Because you, what really happened is they, things weren't going the way they thought they should go or the way they thought God should work, so I'm out of here. Right, Ichabod, over that door. God's not going to be there anymore. That's not New Testament. That's not anything to do. With, it's not even close to correct. The Bible says, <laughs> where any two come together, I'm in their midst. Just because they don't understand God the way you do or they don't see it the way you do doesn't mean God's not working in their life. Amen? So this is why we have to be so careful of our understanding and we have to take things in context, especially when it comes to the fire and the judgment of God. And why I get so frustrated with people because I counsel with people not only in things like with marriage or divorce or uh, failures that people have been through in their life and they have such an old covenant, Old Testament concept of the fire and the judgment of God and what, how that works and that this is how things are going to be or I can never get married again because the Bible says, you know, if, if she marries another man before her husband dies. It says that. But it says Paul is not concerning saying this concerning marriage but Christ and the church. So if you're going to look at Christ and the church, one guy had to die before you can marry another. Adam had to die so Jesus could be married, so we could be married to Jesus. It's the whole picture right there. So please don't take it that I'm angry. But I just get frustrated because you can't even have a conversation with people and you can't even lead people further in God because we have such a mixed covenant understanding and a misconception of the Word of God and the heart of God and how it used to be and how it is now. And if we understand how it is now, our whole concept of everything will change and our, uh, the way we see God will change. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is trying to reveal a glorified God to us and we keep trying to see an unglorified one. Does that make sense? 
And so please hear my heart today. That is my, that is my heart and my passion of what I preach and teach is to get people to see Jesus. I am writing a book called Revealing Jesus. And how when Christ is revealed, grace comes. When you reveal the real Christ, grace comes. Every one of those stories in the New Testament, even though He's in the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant is still in effect, Jesus is still, is still revealing Himself. And if you look at every story where people, all of a sudden they see Jesus, or He's revealed to them of who He is, they don't have an Old Covenant uh, 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 encounter with Him, they have a New Covenant one. He sits down the boat with Peter and Peter looks at him and he's like, and he, Peter realizes who he is. He says, get away from me. Zacchaeus has to climb a tree to see Jesus. If you really study that out, it's because he was little in his own sight. So he climbs a tree. Wait a minute, a tree? Which tree? There were two trees. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the tree of life. Zacchaeus is trying to climb the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If I could just get high enough, if I could just get good enough, if I could just get in a place where I see myself good enough, maybe I could see Jesus. You see it with me? And when Jesus sees him, he says, get out of that tree. Wrong tree, Jack. You're not going to climb your way up to see me. You may be little in your own sight, but I picked you out of all the crowd, buddy. I'm coming to your house. Do you get that? And Jesus just goes to his house. And a transformation happens. Not an Old Testament judgment. He killed him because he'd stolen and robbed from these people. All this time, he's a, he's a thief. But when he sees the revealed Jesus, when he sees Jesus for who he really is, even though he's not been glorified, he sees him for who he is even in that point, and all of a sudden change begins to happen. i got to stop. I just wanted to, to just do like an introduction thing this morning and get you to think. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to read your Bible. I'm amazed at people today who want to be ministers and do ministry that don't read their Bible. <laughs> I'm not trying to be harsh or old school here, but if you don't spend a lot of time in your word, you're really not a minister. Yeah, it used to make me mad a long time ago, too. People say that. I, I got a gifting. You do. But you need to know what you're talking about because you're going to go so far and somebody's going to rock your world. And what I have happened or what I've noticed so many times is the people that are the quietest, that don't ever say anything, that aren't ever seen, or any of those kinds of things, those are the ones who get up every day and they're spending time in the Word with God. They're just praying and saying, God, speak to me. And I run into them and we have a conversation and we can just go pew, right off in the Word and talk about God and how God is and God's working. And they're, they're, they're open to it and they see things more and more and more. I'm telling you, He reveals Himself through that Word and He reveals Himself by His Spirit. Not just by His Spirit, but with both. Amen? Would you stand with me? I'll let you go. How long did I go? Probably wasn't an hour today. The scripture that says, without a vision, people perish. We all quote that about a vision of, for my life. Without a vision for my life. Without me seeing what my purpose is in life. Whatever it is that God has for me in my life. Without that, I perish. That is not what that scripture means. It's, the word vision right there means a revealed word of God. Isn't that one of the definitions of Jesus? He is the word of God. He is the Word made flesh. A revealed Jesus. Seeing Jesus properly. Seeing Jesus corrective, correctly. I won't ever perish. But I'll have everlasting life. Doesn't that fit? Does God have a vision for your life? Does He have a plan? Absolutely. 
But without the revealing of Jesus and seeing Jesus, it won't work. It's just going to be about stuff and climbing the corporate ladders or being successful or having stuff. And it's empty. There's no life in it. Without a vision, people perish because you perish when you stuff. But when He's revealed, grace comes. I'll close with this story. You, you that go here have heard me say it over and over. It's one of my favorite, most favorite stories in Scripture. It's when they bring Jesus to the temple. It's not even Simeon's day to work at the temple. But the Bible says being led by the Spirit. Simeon goes to the temple because he had asked God if he could see the redemption of Israel. If he could see this Messiah before he died. He asked God if he could do that. And one day, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit leads him to the temple. He's going to the temple and he's standing in the temple and walks this young couple with this little baby boy. And the Bible says, he realized it's Jesus. He was revealed. And he goes over before they put him in the hands of a religious system and he scoops him up. And he says, now my eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. Now I could go in peace. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how many scriptures later, but it's just a few verses down and it says, and coming in an instant, Anna. Anna's name means grace. All through scripture, when people see Jesus, if you watch the story, grace walks in the door somewhere. Coming in an instant, grace. Anna the prophetess walks in. Zacchaeus, Jesus comes to his house. Jesus sits down to have him and all of a sudden, Zacchaeus realizes who Jesus is and he begins to change. And he says, if I've stolen anybody, I'm going to give back this many times and I'm going to do this and this and this. And what does Jesus say? Surely, salvation has walked in the door. How are we saved? By grace. See, grace just walked in the door again. Anytime you see that Jesus is revealed, grace is going to be nearby. My whole goal in life is to reveal Jesus, period. I just want people to see Him. Because if you ever get a glimpse of who He really is, grace just walks in the door. And salvation comes to your life. Grace leads. Grace is a teacher. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. I don't have to get you to quit being ungodly. Grace will do that. If I could just get you to see Jesus. The reason people are living ungodly and doing ungodly things is they've never seen Jesus correctly. Because once you ever see Him correctly, all the sin, the temptation, all the stuff just goes out the door. It's so simple. And I've missed it for so many years. And I'd be so frustrated with people trying to figure out how to get them to quit being stupid. And then if you, those of you that have been here a long time, remember several years ago, probably six years ago, the Lord said, I want you to show me for the next 50 weeks. So every week I just preached a message, reveal Jesus. Put an easel up here and I had different pictures of Jesus. Remember that? We had the old European Jesus. We had a little baby Jesus. We had Jesus on a white stallion. My question, Jesus with a whip in the temple, that's my favorite. Everybody, I want to be like Jesus. Well, that could include making a whip and driving people out of your temple. Reveal Jesus. And all of a sudden, people start changing. You know what you and I are? We're supposed to be a mirror. We're supposed to be a living epistle. A living story, a living example. I kept seeing this vision last week of holding a mirror up under my chin. Walking around doing an illustration like this. I know it would be a bad view, but... We're supposed to be a reflection of Him. When you walk in your workplace, they should see Jesus. You say, I can't be Jesus. He's in you. The Holy Spirit is trying to reveal the glorified Jesus through you and I. That's why it's so important to see Him correctly and understand Him correctly. What would Jesus do? That's not a bad thing at all. How would Jesus react to this butt-chewing I'm getting? 
How would Jesus react to another employee that's jealous of me because I'm doing good? How would Jesus do that? That's not a bad thing. I'm not making fun of the what would Jesus do. That's a good point. We're supposed to reflect that. Yeah, but if I just forgive these people, everybody's going to think I'm weak. Well, what would Jesus do? If I'm kind to these people who are being mean to me, that's stupid. Where'd you get that? That's not, that, Jesus did. Amen? Just reflect Him. Tell your neighbor you're a reflector. Make sure you're giving them the right perception of Jesus. Burning down an abortion clinic is not Jesus. That's Old Testament. Standing out in front of it and praying for people and loving the people who are doing it. That's Jesus. When you can serve communion to your Judas, that's Jesus. <laughs> Ain't this fun? Let the fire burn. Let it burn everything out of me that's not Him. Let it burn everything off of me and out of me and around me that's not Him. Father, I praise You for today and life, Your grace, Your mercy. Holy Spirit, thank You for Your constant revealing of Jesus. Jesus, thank You for baptizing us in the Holy Spirit and fire. And though we may not all have it understood in our head this morning, I pray that our, our baby's leaping, so to speak. I pray that, like Elizabeth, the God down deep within us that was birthed maybe a long time ago, but seems to have been laying dormant, our Christian walk that seems like it's doing nothing or performing anything, it's not even alive anymore, I pray today that God, they heard the voice of their beloved. And that baby begins to turn flip-flops. And stir within your people today. I give you praise. You are worthy of it all. God, let them see you. Let them see you in all of us. Thank you for trusting us to reveal you to people. We give you praise. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Would you turn that song up?